Welcome to another episode of Let's Code on Expert TV. My name is Neil Patterson, your host for Let's Code. And today I'm pleased to have with me Graham Charters and Shane O'Rourke from our Liberty and Runtimes team to share the six plus three reasons why Liberty is the ideal runtime for hybrid cloud. Graham and, and Shane, welcome to Let's Code. And I'll hand it over to you, uh, Shane. Hey, hi everyone. Um, by way of introduction to the benefits of Liberty, I just want to spend a few minutes putting this into the wider client and market context. I'm going to touch on a couple of the challenges faced by enterprises and the need for accelerated digital transformation. I also want to touch on why we believe Liberty is the best choice for new cloud native applications, saving time, saving money for developers, IT admins, and overall providing a huge return on investment for application modernization projects. So first slide, please. Graham. So what we've seen is a rapid acceleration in digital transformation, where effectively there's been 12 or 10 years worth of digital transformation within one, one year, driven out of necessity as a result of the pandemic. It's clear that acceleration has become even more important to our clients, where the businesses have had to become increasingly digital, where essentially their applications are their businesses. Uh, CIOs have stated the need to react more quickly as the primary driver to accelerate transformation projects. Some 79% have stated that it highlights the immaturity of their digitization projects. And 96% have stated that they plan to increase timelines by as much as seven years. So next slide, please, Graeme. We know application owners face tremendous time to, value, time to market challenges as a result of these digital transformation challenges. Um, in the background, they have to deal with the operational costs, including the ever-increasing technical debt of their application estate. IT organizations are being asked to deliver digital transformation experiences, maintain their existing states to move to cloud, all within constrained budgets. So managing complexity is key to the IT success. And in particular, challenges, and in particular, the challenges that IT enterprises go through digital transformation. They need to manage the old and they need to develop the new. There are often technical and organizational challenges that are faced. And in addition to that, there are the new te technologies to deal with as well as regulatory requirements. When we speak to our clients, they echo the same concerns the complexity of their application estates, the drive to reduce costs and the lack of technical expertise uh, required as part of digital transformation. So next slide, please, Graham. One activity we've done in conjunction with uh, Forrester Key Analyst is the CEI study that was completed this year which highlighted the key benefits um, as a result of their investigations, as a result of the adoption of Liberty. So what they found was a 50% increase in developer productivity, a 40% increase in IT admin pro productivity, and 195% ROI and payback within eight months. So onto the technical discussion and over to you, Graham. Thanks, Shane. Um, so Shane's kind of talked about some of the context, um, what, how we see uh, or the challenges that uh, our customers are seeing uh, uh, today um, around digital transformation and some of the benefits that um, have been derived from moving to Liberty. So let's look at um, some of the details on why uh, why those, uh, what it is about Liberty that uh, means that customers see those benefits, that developers see the 50% um, 
um, increase in productivity and so on. And, and over the past probably year and a half or so, maybe even two years, we've talked historically about the kind of six reasons why liberty. And you may have seen seen me or other people present uh, the, the six reasons in the past. And, and more recently in discussions with Shane, we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of, there, there are some other reasons that we've not really covered. So we've got that, and that's why it's kind of six plus three. So I'll I'll recap the six on this slide. I've then got a few slides talking about the other three, but then we'll get into a demo. And what I want to do in the demo is, is kind of try and demonstrate some of these key re key reasons, but also kind of show, as part of that demo, show a kind of end to end. So starting from nothing, um, developing a new uh, a new microservice, if you like, packaging that in a container, pushing it to a cloud uh, a cloud environment. In this case, I'll be using uh, OpenShift on the Azure cloud. Um, and so, so you can see some of the benefits actually in, a, in action. Um, so when I talk about these six reasons, I like to actually uh, kind of collapse them down into kind of three, three reasons. So the, fir the first two of the reasons, so developer experience and Kubernetes optimized, they're all about optimizing um, the development, development and operational experience for modern, modern uh, cloud practices. Um, so with the developer experience, what we've done is a, a, a lot of work to stream, essentially streamline the developer experience to fit with, uh, well, to essentially increase uh, uh, developer productivity. So when you think about uh, how development works or, or the life cycle of a, an update to an application, a lot of time is spent in development, making changes to the code, building that code, um, testing that code and so on. So we've done a lot of work in, in something called dev mode. Um, to enable that rapid developer experience, and I'll demonstrate that. We've done a lot of work because because um, modern uh, deployments are often Kubernetes nowadays. We've done a lot of work around con uh, container and Kubernetes uh, development, so uh, enabling you to do dev mode in containers, so do your development in an environment that's based in containers, um, and uh, test your t uh, do your testing of the applications um, in containers as well. On the Kubernetes optimi optimized side, we thought very hard about uh, the operational aspects of applications and deploying them to Kubernetes environments and, and try to address some of these challenges. So for example, when you're building a container image and publishing that to a registry, you don't necessarily know what the environment is gonna be like that it's gonna be deployed into. So how do you optimize that, uh, that runtime? So with Liberty, what we do is we self-tune the runtime or, or Liberty self-tunes itself um, it optimizes its thread pool based on the environment it finds itself in. So you can deploy it to one environment today, another environment to up tomorrow, and you know you'll get the best performance. And also if that environment changes over time, you'll continue to get the best performance. We also provide production ready container images in Docker Hub and the IBM Container Registry. And I'll, I'll demonstrate using those to build a production ready, uh, ready microservice. <laughs> The next two, zero migration and continuous delivery, are all about optimizing uh, the way we, well, optimizing the architecture of Liberty and the way we deliver Liberty to fit very well with continuous integration and continuous delivery. So what zero migration means is essentially, if you've got an application today uh, running on Liberty, in three, four, five years time, it'll continue to run on Liberty. We don't break the APIs that we provide. Um, we don't remove APIs, we don't break the configuration. And so that means you can develop your application, uh, keep it on Liberty and move up the levels of Liberty, getting security fixes, performance enhancements and so on. And if you don't want to evolve that application, you don't have requirements to change that application, you're not going to be forced to make changes to that application just because uh, maybe there's another, another release coming out, which other runtimes will force you to do. Um, and, and this is particularly important when you think about, I mean, we, we talk to customers about migration of existing applications and how that's a very costly exercise. It can take them sometimes 18 months to do a version to version migration. If you imagine you're moving to microservices and you've therefore got maybe tens or hundreds more applications, you've just um, increased that problem by a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, continuous delivery is how we release the runtime. So we we have a single stream of Liberty. We don't we don't have have forks and maintain different uh, different uh, branches of Liberty. We basically have a single stream that we release every four weeks. And in that release, we roll in the fixes from the previous release. So if you 
follow the continuous delivery model and keep up to date on Liberty and, and do that by taking advantage of zero migration because it's, it's essentially effortless to do that. Um, then you can stay current, stay current on fixes, stay current on performance enhancements and essentially eliminate technical debt. Um, the last two are really all about uh, saving costs in terms of your deployments. So Liberty in combination with the IBM Semaru uh, runtime, which is based on the Eclipse OpenJ9 JVM, is a very efficient combination. So the Eclipse um, OpenJ9 JVM uses about half the memory of, of other, other Java runtimes out there. And Liberty's throughput performance is extremely competitive um, in, our, in our tests, about two times faster than Tomcat. So if you combine both of those benefits, you can get in some cases up to a kind of four times density increase over, for example, using Spring Boot on Tomcat. So essentially you can cut your, um, your cloud costs down to a quarter. Also, Liberty is a modular runtime. So you can configure the server to just, or configure the runtime to just include the capabilities that are required by your application. Uh, and this can mean anything up to an 80% disk space saving and a 56% memory saving. Uh, and this space might seem an interesting thing to consider, but if you're creating container images and pushing those around, then if you can save on disk space, you're going to increase your push time, save on Docker caches and so on. So that's the six reasons. And then the three additional reasons that, uh, that uh, Shane and I kind of discussed um, and have been written up on an article on the uh, IBM Middleware user community, if you're interested. Um, are, the first one is uh, availability on public clouds. So we felt it's important. Um, we occasionally, probably more than I would like, get questions from customers saying, can I run Liberty on, on a cloud, on this cloud or that cloud? And the answer is yes. So actually for many, many years, we've supported running Liberty on, on uh, various different clouds. We support Liberty on all the leading cloud Kubernetes services, for example including all the managed OpenShift environments. So if you're using Azure or AWS or IBM Cloud or Google Cloud and so on, then you can use, uh, you can use Liberty in those environments. But also what we're doing is we're evolving the, uh, our capabilities to, to make it even easier to do that. So we, we provide capabilities that make it easy to build and deploy uh, containers into those environments, but we're also extending that with marketplace entries. And the first of those are, are entries that we've created in the Azure cloud in collaboration with Microsoft. So we have, for example, uh, an Azure Red Hat OpenShift marketplace entry that makes it easy to stand up uh, an OpenShift environment with all the uh, with the right um, Liberty operator or pre-installed and also optionally deploying an application as part of that setup. And that can be WebSphere Liberty or Open Liberty. And similarly, we've got uh, an equivalent capability for the Azure Kubernetes service. And I, sh I should have said at the start of this one that uh, from from our surveys from and from other surveys, essentially um, a lot of our customers are moving uh, moving to clouds and they're choosing various different clouds, including hybrid clouds, so a mixture mixtures of different clouds. Um, and in doing so, they're also choosing uh, predominantly choosing Kubernetes as the as the deployment environment. Hence, the focus on Kubernetes in this in this uh, this particular reason. Reason number eight, breadth of architecture support. Um, so we've seen a, a kind of evolution, I think, of, of uh, runtimes coming along, uh, focusing on things like microservices and so on. And the way Liberty started out, Liberty started out as a, a, as a, a lightweight runtime with a, a modest set of capabilities. And then we evolved it over time to, to add more and more um, programming model capabilities. And I'll talk a bit, a bit, a bit more about that in, in reason nine. But because it's modular, it doesn't suffer from the bloat that other environments suffer from because we essentially have a lightweight kernel and you can pick and choose the capabilities you want to put into that runtime. So that means that Liberty can support monolithic applications and it can go all the way down to microservice uh, based applications. And the fact is that um, when we talk to customers and when you see surveys and so on, not everything is going to be a microservice. Uh, it will depend on the application needs. It will depend on organizational capabilities and so on. Uh, and on the right, I'm just showing, showing a, a few of the considerations that customers go through when they're deciding um, whether to go with a, a, a monolith or whether to go with a microservice. It also depends on actually what the customer has in terms of needs for that application. If it, if it doesn't need to evolve um, 
particularly quickly and it doesn't doesn't need to scale in the way that microservices enable um, then it's probably best off created as a model either a new cloud native monolith or, or maybe it's an existing monolith today so the great thing about liberty is because it supports this spectrum of uh, architecture styles you can choose to use Liberty irrespective of what type of application you're going to create. And you can also, if you start out with a monolithic application, you can refactor that to microservices over time and you don't have to change the runtime you're using. You don't have to change your opera operational approach. Okay, number nine, breadth of API support. So there are actually two dimensions to this. So I talked about um, the feature model and zero migration. And we achieve zero migration because what we can do is we define features for the different API capabilities. And then those features, we keep them around, we keep them available as part of the, the, uh, the runtime install. So we can add new capabilities and still keep the old ones. Whereas with other runtimes, what happens is as soon as they implement a new set of APIs, a new version of the APIs, they have to get rid of the old APIs and therefore you have to migrate your application. Whereas with, with Liberty, we continue to have Java E6 support, Java E7, Java E8, Jakarta E8, and more recently, Jakarta E9 and 9.1. Um, we also have microprofile capabilities, and we also have the ability to, uh, uh, we have features that let you or enable you to deploy Spring Boot applications to Liberty. And, and if you're doing Spring Boot and you do that, then you get the, the additional kind of memory and performance uh, throughput benefits that Liberty and, and Semeru uh, provide. So, so there's the dimension of the kind of breadth of API support, the fact that we support Spring Boot, MicroProfile, Java E, and Jakarta E, but there's also the depth, um, which is kind of relates to the zero migration, the fact that we release APIs, we don't remove them, so you're not forced to migrate over time. Okay, so that's uh, that's it for, for slides and talking. Well, not talking, I'm gonna carry on talking. So what I'd like to do now is do a demo. Um, so fingers crossed, my, my family are actually, uh, streaming on the internet and playing games so <laughs> we'll see how that affects things i may have to pop out and tell them to stop all right so uh, i'm just gonna close oops just gonna get minimize this window for now i must not close i closed the browser down earlier earlier on forgetting that Streamyard was there uh, and let's just get the instructions up okay so what i'm going to do the first thing i'm going to do is i will I need to create a new project. So I'm gonna create a new microservice. So I shall go to the Liberty Starter. So hopefully you can see that okay. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So the Liberty Starter is essentially a web page that lets you, uh, will generate a starter project for you. There are starters for other runtimes. This is nothing kind of unique to Liberty, but I wanted to demonstrate um, uh, the fact that it was available and, and easy to use. So I'm gonna choose a name for my project that I'm creating. Uh, it's going to be a Maven project. I can use Java 8, 11, or 17, all the current, uh, current in support versions of Java. I'm going to choose 11 because that's what I've got on my on my Mac. Um, I could choose Jakarta 8, 9, or 7. Um, Jakarta 8 is eight, the latest, but I'm going to choose, uh, sorry, Jakarta 9 is the latest. I'm going to use, uh, use 8 because that's what the code snippets I've got use. Um, and I could use the various levels of microprofile. Of course, I can't choose five and yes, unless I choose um, uh, Jakarta E9 because those are the two that are compatible together. All right, so I'll generate my project. And we can see that's created my project for me. And I'm just going to show it in my finder. Um, that's probably a bit small, but we're not going to uh, be, there, be there very long. So I'm going to extract the project and open that in a terminal so we can take a look at it. And this one I will make much, much bigger. That's enough command pluses. Okay, so this is the project it's created for me. I've got a Docker file. I've got a readme to tell me about the project. I've got a Maven wrapper, so I don't have to have Maven or the right version of Maven installed on my laptop in order to, to build this project. Um, it's got a Maven POM, which is going to be the build instructions for my project. And it's got a source folder, which has got some source code in there and, and also the server configuration. So I'm now going to start up VS Code, because that's the environment I happen to be using. And I've got the Liberty um, Liberty tools installed into this environment. So let's just uh, get rid of that and uh, expand this a little bit more. Uh, hopefully that's okay for you to all see. Actually, I'm gonna shrink it down just one more. 
OK, so uh, let's have a quick look at the project. So we've got the source for the application. Now, we had a, a, a debate uh, in our team, which we took, took to Twitter probably a couple of years ago, saying, if we generate code, how much do you want us to generate? And they said the, the results were close, but, the, but in favor of generating just enough code to get started and, and not, not too much, so I have to delete some. So basically, what we do is we generate the REST application because uh, this is going to be a, a, a JAX RS or, or a, a REST service. Um, but we don't generate any REST resources because typically you would have to delete those. We also generate a server configuration. So this is essentially the whole server configuration for this server. And actually, because I know I'm going to be just doing a, uh, doing a REST service, I'm going to, oops, if only I could type. Uh, I'm going to just configure the JAX RS service in. So you saw previously it had Jakarta E8 and MicroProfile 4.1, but I don't need all of that. I just need JAX RS. So I'm going to configure the JAX RS service in. Uh, and so what I can do is I'm going to start the server now, and this is going to start it in dev mode. So this is the down on the left hand side is the Liberty Developer Tools. And what that does is I didn't have a server installed. I didn't download the server as part of building that pro uh, as part of generating that project. All I got was some configuration and a build file. And that build is going to pull down the Liberty kernel from Maven Central. Um, it could config uh, it could pull it down from any Maven repository if you've got your own um, uh, internal repository. Uh, and it's going to install the feature. And you saw it's installed JAXRS, but it also knows that JAXRS needs these other features. So it's installed the JAXRS client. JSONP and Servlet 4. And so that's it. So I've I've got a server uh, application built and all running. And you can see it doesn't really do anything because I didn't have any REST resources. But if I delete this, you can see there's actually a Liberty server there. So this is just the default landing page for Liberty. So now what I want to do is uh, actually, first thing, I'll show the dynamic nature of the server. So I'm going to, uh, and this is useful if you're a developer, I'm going to actually include uh, the open API feature because I want to, I'm going to be developing an API. I want to be able to try that API out, see that, see that API. So I've just saved my server configuration and you can see it's detected the change and it's installing that feature. So it's pulling down another feature from Maven Central, installing it into the runtime and it's done that. Uh, it's not restarted the server or anything. Uh, and now I can see that I've got the Swagger UI available for me to, to try out any REST services that I create. OK, so now I want to actually create a REST service. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one called restresource.java. And this is where I'm going to go and just steal some code from my little cheat sheet, uh, rather than you watch me make lots of typos. And so this is the REST service that, uh, that we're going to uh, going to implement. It's essentially just returning the system properties. This is actually the REST service we use in a lot of our guides on the Open Liberty site. So if I save that, you'll see very quickly it's actually it's recompiled it, it's updated the server. And so if I go back to here and refresh, we can see we've got a REST API now. Uh, and I can try that out uh, and give it a go. And we'll see here, hopefully, yep, there we've got the system properties back. So that's the kind of developer experience, experience, the rapid in a loop experience, the ability to see changes, the ability to change the runtime um, dynamically based on whatever your application needs as, whilst you're going through that development process. Um, but OK, so I've developed my REST service. What I want to do now um, is use that in, in a, a container and, pu and push that to a, a, an OpenShift environment. Uh, and to do that, I need, uh, let's, have a, let's have a quick look at the Docker file first. So this is a Docker file for a, a, a production deployment. So the first line, this is basically saying, I'm going to pull something from the IBM container registry um, rather than Docker Hub because the IBM container registry doesn't have rate limiting. And I'm going to pull the kernel slim image that's based on Java 11 um, using the OpenJ9 JVM, which is on the UBI um, uh, OS layer. Um, and so that's the image at my starting point, and that just includes the kernel. And so what I do next is I copy the server configuration, which we saw earlier, um, into the config directory, and I run this feature script. And that feature script is essentially going to make uh, it's going to install all the features that are required by that server configuration. 
And so this is how we make it very easy to build a, a container that fits exactly the needs of the application. And then lastly, we're going to copy a WAR file over into the apps directory, and we're going to run this configure, uh, configure script. And this configure script essentially optimizes it, uh, optimizes the image um, for production use. It essentially starts and stops the container, primes um, the class cache and so on, so that the server will start very quickly. So we basically pay the price during build time um, for doing that optimization so that when you deploy it at runtime, it will start very quickly because your chances are you're starting multiple servers, but you're only building once. Okay, so we need a war file. Uh, and if I look in the target directory, you can see there is no war file. And that's because I've been running uh, using dev mode and dev mode essentially creates a logical war, a logical war file based on the, the, the individual artifacts that are in the source and target directories. So the first thing I need to do is actually build the war file. And that should be pretty quick. And then we look in the target, target directory and there we go, we've got the war file. So now I'm gonna build uh, the container. Uh, my God, my typing's going well today. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna jinx it now. Um, so that's essentially, I'm gonna build a container called, uh, that's tagged as Liberty uh, Cloud Demo. Um, it's running the feature script now. This typically takes about 20 seconds. Um, that's doing uh, pulling down and installing the features uh, as, a, as a separate layer um, into my Docker image. So hopefully now, oh, this is because my kids are streaming. They've added two seconds on. Um, and then the last one, configure.sh. Um, as I said, this is doing the optimization. So this is starting and stopping the server a couple of times to prime, uh, prime caches and so on. And this one, for this particular server takes, has taken about 15 seconds usually. There we go, yeah. So now I've um, got my server or all, all, all my image built. There we go, typo time. Um, what I'm gonna do is just start that, um, just to see, uh, just to make sure uh, it everything's all right. And so it listens on port 8080, so I'm exposing that. And you can see that started very quickly. Um, I can go to the open API UI, and of course that won't work because it's not really at that location. That needs to be uh, localhost. And there we go. So this is the one that's running in the container and I can try it out. And if I execute, if you, if you remembered what the properties were like before, you'll see that the properties are different now because the system properties are essentially the properties inside the container rather than the properties of my Mac. Okay, so all good so far. So what I want to do now is I need to push, so I need to push that up to my OpenShift environments. What I'll do first is um, show you the, uh, show you the environment or, or show you what we have as a, a marketplace entry or as a way of um, deploying into or creating uh, uh, OpenShift environments for, for deploying Liberty applications. Um, so in collaboration with Microsoft, we've created a number of different uh, different offerings. So we've got the uh, Liberty on Azure Kubernetes service, Liberty on ARO and OpenShift, and that's the one we're gonna use. But we've also got uh, traditional WebSphere uh, network deployment, uh, deployments on virtual machines, and also traditional WebSphere based single server deployments on virtual machines. Um, so I'll just show you how this how this works, but I won't actually go through the process because doing a new OpenShift cluster takes about 40 minutes. Um, okay, so basically, hopefully we're gonna be there. Right, yep, so this is the, uh, the entry in the marketplace that I can get started from. So I can now click create. And this basically takes you through a wizard process. So you fill out a few form entries. Um, this is basically some, some initial uh, information about where it's gonna be deployed to. So uh, the East US region on the Azure cloud, a resource group, which is essentially a, a way of uh, collecting up the various resources for your deployment so you can manage them more easily. You can delete them quick, uh, more quickly and so on. Um, then there's configuration of the cluster. I can use an existing cluster if I want or, or a new one. Um, there's some uh, Red Hat configuration that's required. And then this project is essentially uh, essentially a Kubernetes namespace. So this is the environment for my deployments. Um, and I, I get a, I have a, a name and a, oh, I have credentials that allow me to sign into that. And the, the visibility of the things in that OpenShift cluster are limited for this particular ID. And then I can optionally provide an application through a, a reference to a container image. 
Um, so that's that's the uh, the environment. What I'll do now is uh, I've zoomed in. So hang on, uh, I've not done the navigation with it. So zoomed in. So I'll go and have a look at an existing one, and in fact, the one we're going to deploy into. Um, so this is my uh, resource group for my deployment, and you can see I've got a, an OpenShift cluster. And I can actually, from here, go to the console. So this is the OpenShift console. I'm already logged in because um, I was using it earlier. Um, I have had a couple of problems where I've not been able to switch to administrator. But if I do a refresh, there we go. All right. Um, so we can see, uh, let's have a look at workloads and pods. We can see there's nothing deployed in there. Um, we can see the operator. So this is the operator we install, the Liberty operator. It says Open Liberty operator, and that's indeed its name, but it allows you to deploy Open Liberty and WebSphere Liberty. Um, so you can provide configuration to this um, to deploy applications. And that's what I will do, but I won't do it through the UI. I'll do it through the command line. Um, last thing to look at, we can look at, uh, oops, oh, there we go, builds, uh, image streams. And you can just see, uh, this is <laughs> this is the image I'm going to push. I'm going to do an update uh, update to this image. You can see I was actually trying it out a few hours ago just to make sure it worked, and it did. Then, <laughs> and hopefully, it will again this time. All right. So now back to VS Code. So what I want to do is I need to do a few logins first. So I'm going to log into um, uh, Azure. And I only need to, I don't have to do this, but I'm doing this because I um, I use the Azure command line just to make some of my OpenShift commands a little bit easier. Um, so whilst that's just finishing off, I'm going to log into OpenShift now using the project manager that was specified in that uh, that initial UI uh, for provisioning the environment. So my project manager is called Limited Mugger. Um, and you can see this is my project um, that was created for me, and I also the OpenShift image, image registry that was created for me. And lastly, I'll sign into the uh, image registry as well. <laughs> OK, so now I'm ready to, to actually do things. So what I, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tag the image that we created. So it wasn't previously 1.0, so I'm going to tag it as the 1.0 the image. Um, which is very quick because that's all just happened locally. And then I'm going to push this image up to the image registry. Now, I did bump into a problem when I tried this uh, earlier. This, so this one that's 31.18 um, got stuck at the very end, which I believe uh, from Googling is a, is a problem that other people have had, and uh, I had to restart my Docker daemon. So when it gets to 31.18, I want everyone to hold their breath until it's done. <laughs> I shall be holding mine. Uh, it's only ever done it once, and I guess at least I know how to fix it, although you'll have to wait a minute while I start, start Docker. Come on. My up speed is particularly great on my uh, home internet. OK, it's got to the end. This is where it got stuck, but I'm sure it'll be fine. It's only ever gone one wrong once. Probably things like that. You never know when to give up on it and try again or restart the Docker daemon. So we'll leave that a few seconds. Oh, it's done it. And we'll see that this, yeah, there we go. So it's finished pushing it up there. And we can see the in, and this is in dual cloud in uh, East US, uh, that it says it's just been updated to the image I've just pushed. So now I want to be able to deploy that thing. Uh, and I'm going to use the, as I said, the Open Liberty operator. So in order to do that, I need to create a, a configuration file, uh, a YAML, YAML file. So what I'll do is I'll do that here. Um, and we'll call it uh, Liberty Cloud Demo Deploy.yaml. And here's one I prepared earlier. Actually, with the, um, with the Azure Marketplace um, deployment route, it actually provides this deployment YAML for you um, if, uh, as, a, as a starting point. It, it's actually got a couple of things. It, it, it doesn't know what the image is 
well, actually, if you choose an image, it knows what the image is going to be called and so on. But uh, if not, then it will just give you a template for you as a starting point. So this is going to deploy an open Liberty application. Um, it's going to be called Liberty Cloud Demo. It's going to be deployed into the namespace called Project 6AC5B9. Uh, trips off the tongue. It's going to be this image, which is the one we've just pushed up. And I want two replicas. Uh, and I want to expose it so it will get a root. Uh, and I always want to update if I, if I push a, a new image. All right. So uh, I must remember to save that file. Last time I didn't save it when I was trying it out. OK. Uh, so what I'm going to do is deploy that. And we can see how it's getting on. All looking good. All done. OK. And what we can do, we can look in uh, in OpenShift, in the OpenShift um, UI, and we can see, oops, we can see now we've got the two pods running. Uh, and because I exposed it, it should, in the networking section, have a route available. Uh, and we can go to that route. And we can see Liberty's there. And I can do things like. Um, Go to the note, the open API UI. Hopefully you can see this. Just make it a little bit bigger. And try out the API. And there we go. Got the results back. So that's shown a kind of end-to-end uh, -end demo of um, creating a new project, the developer experience through the Liberty tools as part of VS Code, but they also we have them available as part of IntelliJ and so on. Um, showing dev, dev for the rapid in a loop experience, um, and then using the Liberty container images uh, that are available in Docker Hub or the IBM Container Registry to build an image that fits exactly the needs of my application. So it's a nice lightweight uh, image. Pushing that up to an OpenShift environment and then on the Azure Red Hat OpenShift, uh, and that's an environment that I set up um, previously through the uh, the Azure Marketplace entry. Now, of course, the way I built the container and the way I pushed that in, into production um, isn't how you would do that in, in real life. You're going to want to do automation. You'll probably maybe use something like source to image um, or, or, you, or um, Red Hat Open Pipelines. Or if you're going into the AKS environment, then you might use um, GitHub Actions and so on to do your automated deployments and so on. Um, because you want repeatability. You don't want to rely on someone typing the right commands in a command line. OK, um, so that's it in terms of the session. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, sorry, have we got a slide for reference, which I'll just leave there so you can, if you want to screen capture that um, uh, for any of the uh, any of the information. There's, um, articles on the left-hand side in the middle, uh, links to, to um, videos around Liberty and so on. And on the right, uh, links to materials where you can try things out. Um, they're invariably on Open Liberty IO. Well, thanks, Graham uh, and uh, Shane. I uh, really appreciate um, that session. Uh, it's clear that you spent a lot of time uh, developing Open Liberty to be very developer friendly and um, being able to go through these different environments and deploy the application in uh, in a very quick time is um, uh, something I, I I know developers are looking for and uh, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to, to basically extend what we did a few I guess several months ago where we looked at the six reasons and um, expand upon that to, uh, to hit these other three. And your demo certainly uh, helped to uh, show that, especially around the uh, different cloud environments. And and um, I, you know, look forward to seeing uh, continued progress on uh, on the use of Liberty. Um, you've given us some uh, references. Are there any uh, last thoughts, uh, Shane or Graham, that you want to share before we uh, call it a session? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, if you haven't tried Liberty, please um, do give it a try. Um, hopefully, you'll find it a good experience. But if you've got feedback, um, then then yeah, please get in touch. Um, there are also on the Open Liberty IO site. Um, there's a support page. Um, it 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 has a link to where you can get support for the for Open Liberty as a product. 
but also it has uh, a number of links to places where you can reach out to the development team and the community to to get answers to questions and so on. So yeah, please please do get in touch and, and let us know your experience and feedback. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, please, um, for those that are watching, please uh, uh, join us next week for uh, another episode of uh, Let's Code on Expert TV. Thank you. Thanks, Ian.